will be switching gears now and we'll be talking about ocular pathology. Uh, that is just like the viral diseases in pigs, a very broad topic. And I like the picture and the comparison that Fabio made yesterday that this all just represents the tip of the iceberg, but hopefully it provides you the basis or to raise the interest in working in ocular pathology if you have not already been doing this. And so I will talk about how to go about preparing hopefully good sections first before I will be talking about disease processes this afternoon. And so basically I will then um, talk about this topic here where I had the contribution by Jim Brender. He was in academia for a while before he ended up going into toxicologic pathology and has retired in the meantime. But some of the images are from him. And so with that, I will get started. And uh, for those who have looked at histologic sections of eyes, may have realized how difficult it is to get a good section. That is definitely a tissue where one ends up with a lot of artifacts. And this is what I would consider pretty much an ideal section, though even here you can see that we still had some tissue tearing and loss. But hopefully, as I'm going to be giving some suggestions on what to do at each step of the process, you will be able to come to an end product that looks pretty much like what we have here. So let's get started. Um, so basically either we have a sample that is being collected on the necropsy floor, or we have a sample that is being collected then in, uh, from an alive animal that may look like what we have represented here. This one here is a nucleation specimen where we have the sutures that are keeping the eyelids closed. And unfortunately, that is often the way how we get our samples submitted. And I say unfortunately because the best would be to, after having collected the sample, then remove all these tissues that are extraocular. So the reason why you would want to do that, and here you're looking at a rat eye, but it's basically to point out that the more tissue you leave together with the globe, the more likely is that you end up getting some artifacts like, for instance, here, the retinal detachment. Because it obviously takes a while for formalin to penetrate through tissues. And so the more tissue you have around the globe, the more it will end up taking then for formalin to be able to penetrate into the actual globe and be able to fix the intraocular structures. Which is why I like the injection technique when one is dealing with formalin. And I will show how to go about doing that. Uh, there are obviously some exceptions when you still would like to keep everything together. And that is when the disease process, like the, this particular case here, this very big mast cell tumor, is actually in the extraocular tissues. And you would like to see how that is, what effect that is having on the actual globe, and where you would then also want to preserve as much as you can the surgical margins then on that <laughs> specimen. So again, there are some exceptions where you would want to keep these things together, but when you are dealing with a specimen where the disease is in the globe itself, I tell our students and our ophthalmologists that ideally they remove this. I still like to look at the eyelids and the other tissues, but submit them separately, fix them separately from the actual globe so that I can then um, basically have better fixed specimens at the end. Something that I know sometimes happens by accident, mostly when we have students that are collecting globes from the uh, necropsy floor, but then also sometimes people do it on purpose, kind of thinking that they're actually doing good as they are incising the globe to facilitate formalin to penetrate it. The problem is when this happens, you may end up then with a specimen that looks like this on this slide. And so everything starts falling apart. Mostly if the tissue is not very well preserved, 
And that certainly makes it a lot tougher for you to be able to interpret the changes. One of the changes that we would like to be able to interpret is whether retinal detachment is real. And if you have something like this, that's certainly very hard for you to kind of judge whether that could still have been a real detachment or whether that is just an artifact because everything is kind of jumbled up then on this slide. Depending on how, the, how they would be doing the nucleation, um, the veterinarian would have to be very conscious about the fact that if they truly would be using hemostatic forceps, they would be inducing some remarkable, some, some really marked artifacts as they are squeezing the tissues then in these locations. So ideally, they would refrain from doing this or from twisting, because as you and, and students sometimes get frustrated as they are trying to remove a globe from the orbit, and may then also use this twisting technique, which will then end up displacing the optic nerve then somewhat into the globe. And again, that is an artifact that if you have any changes in the optic nerve, uh, may then be hard to be interpreted, uh, whether that's real or whether that's just the result of the sample collection. So once you have the globe, and if it's an intraocular disease, hopefully have removed the, the tissues around it, the next step would then be fixation. And so fixation should certainly happen as soon as possible. And so I've been part of research projects where they collected the globe right after euthanasia, and the ophthalmologists were very conscious in trying to get the sample into fixative as soon as possible. Because the longer you wait, the more likely you have changes, particularly in the retina, that if you are hoping to see something subtle there, you may kind of have a hard time to know what is real versus what is just the result of some initial autolysis. So fixation, uh, just like the other tissues, the ideal would be 1 to 10, and people say even 1 to 20. Uh, in the fixative, and I will be talking about the type of fixative next, <coughs> Um, just like for other tissues, make sure you don't put that into a container that has a lot of other tissues so the fixative cannot really reach the globe. If needed, I have not really felt the need for that, but if needed, you may want to use a gauze or potentially a paper towel um, to cover the globe and make sure that it is truly all covered uh, with the fixative. And ideally, if you're collecting left and right, keep them in separate containers, or if you cannot do that, I always suggest to our students that they label, with a pencil obviously, a paper towel, wrap the globe right versus left into that paper towel and then put that in formalin so that you will then know as you are trimming then what you are, <laughs> what you have in your hand. So if you use the wrong size of a container, you may, I mean that's just like for brain and so on, you may end up then with something that acquires the shape of that container, um, which if you are trying to evaluate the thickness of the sclera, for instance, if you have scleral thinning and so on, that may, cert that may then be precluded by uh, this type of artifact. Uh, the type of fixative will also vary. So here we have buons, uh, here we have a for regular formalin solution, Generally what we end up using, and that's what the veterinarian generally have easily available, is just formalin. It's not the ideal, and at least in the ToxPath world, they often end up using Davidson's. At, uh, older uh, uh, ocular cases have commonly been fixed in buons. Our histotechnicians don't like buons because it has picric acid, and so as it dries on the container, if you were then to open the lid, for instance, and induce some fraction on that dry material, it could potentially explode. And so they rather don't deal with that. And formalin is fine, as long as you are kind of conscious about moving it along and avoiding artifacts then to, uh, to a maximum. So here are basically the fixatives. I already mentioned the formalin. And so that is one where the injection technique really works best to guarantee the best fixation. Paraformaldehyde is 
to my experience, often used in research. So uh, I was at Michigan State for a while, where they have uh, Michigan State University, where they have a very strong ophthalmic research group. And so they were then often getting th their eyes fixed in 4% paraformaldehyde. The techniques, as we talked about earlier, kind of getting the blocks or getting the tissues and paraffin blocks as soon as possible in the best way possible is important for additional testing. Uh, immunosochemistry, which is one test that we often perform on tissues, may not be equally, kind of the protocol may not be the same when comparing <laughs> formal and fixed specimens and paraformaldehyde fixed specimens. So that's just something to be aware of. Glutaraldehyde is what we generally use for electromicroscopy, if you anticipate that you may need that. Uh, Davidson solution, as I mentioned, that is most often used in Toxpath. The disadvantage, I would say, of Davidson's, while it's a fixative that works very fast and very well, uh, the tissue generally gets completely white. And I will show you some specimens that have been fixed that way. So as you are trimming your specimen, you may lose some orientation then because suddenly everything looks white. Um, so you may then have to label with ink, tissue ink, or some, some like for instance the optic nerve or the superior versus inferior portions and so on, just to avoid that you get lost at the time of trimming. Buen solution, so again that was one that I know at least in the past has been very commonly used. Again, it has the problem of the picric acid. Another problem that it has is that you should really not keep the specimen in that fixative for more than 18 to, I would say, maximum of 24 hours, and then wash it, rinse it very thoroughly in, in alcohol multiple times, and it should then be submitted in alcohol to a diagnostic lab if you already not have the specimen in a diagnostic lab. If the longer the specimen stays in wounds, the harder it will get, and the more difficult it will, it will be then to be able to get the histologic sections, if you want to do special stains or things like that. And then Zenker's solution is really one that um, is on the list here, as there are certainly other fixatives too, but that have not been used for, for a long time. Now in terms of the injection technique, which as I said is something that we do very commonly because that's what you would recommend for formalin, which is the most commonly used fixative, at least in a diagnostic setting. Um, we would take a small needle and you would, you would then be looking, and that generally works best in small animals. In large animals, it's often easier to just look at the globe and because they have the somewhat kind of horizontal pupil, that you end up then deciding what the horizontal position is of that globe. Again, looking at the small animal eye, dog or cat, after removing all the tissues, look for these vessels that run horizontally. And that is what, uh, what we use as a reference then to inject the globe with formalin. In a small animal, it's generally 0.2 or 0.3 ml until it gets turgid. I, I've had some people kind of saying, oh, but if we inject it, we will create pressure atrophy or pressure onto the retina and we'll have lesions or changes that we will not know how to differentiate from something that may have been there before collection, that may have been there in vivo. I've, uh, I've never seen any problem like that. And Jim Render, this colleague of mine, he said that he got to inject the globe with such high amount that it flew across the room because he put so much pressure into that globe that it kind of detached from the needle. So he was sure that he had induced some changes within the globe, but that was not the case at all. When he saw the section later, there was nothing that would have told him by just looking at that section that he had inject more formalin into that globe than into any other one that he had injected with less before. And so you can really not over-inject formalin if there is such a thing. Uh, in, an, in a large animal, obviously, you would have to inject more 
But in addition to allowing fixation from inside out, at the same time that you get it from outside in, because again, you still would want to put that into obviously a jar then after you do that. Um, so in addition to guaranteeing this fixation from inside out, uh, it will also allow you to maintain the round shape of the globe. Because if you have ever put a non-injected globe into a fixative, you will see that it shrinks. And so you will never be able to get this nice round anatomically compatible section. So it makes it easier for trimming and it, it allows you then for a section that is more like it should be anatomically. Now another thing in addition to paying attention to making that section more or less parallel here to this long ciliary artery is to do that injection where the globe is the widest because that will get you into the vitreous chamber. So we would have the lens more or less at this level here and the vitreous chamber would then be most of the posterior, pretty much the entire posterior compartment here. And so that's where you would want to inject the formalin. You don't have to worry about getting anything out. Just add formalin as much as it's necessary to make that globe being turgid. And the reason why, and I'll come back to that again later, the reason why we we generally do this injection at the, kind of parallel to this artery is because our section will be perpendicular to that because we have remembered that in most of the animals and, and there I'm speaking of mammals um, we have the tapetum and the non-tapetal region and we in changes like glaucoma we will have a difference between what happens to the dorsal tapetal region and the ventral non-tapetal region. And because we may induce some artifacts through the injection, we want to do that away from where we get our section. And so I'll be, I'll be coming back to that again in a little bit. But so formalin, again, that's what I use, that's what many uh, have available. And so that's uh, what I would recommend, unless you have a good reason, like in Toxpad, they want to get the best fixation possible, uh, want to avoid or at least reduce artifacts as much as possible. In that case, they end up then using Davidson's. But formalin is fine. It's definitely good when you're dealing with the cornea. Just remember, in order to get the best result, you should be able to inject the eyes. In eyes where you cannot really do that, and so that would include rodent eyes, because if you have ever looked at rodent eyes, they are very small, obviously, and they have a very large lens. So if you were to inject rodent eyes, you probably would do more damage than good, because you don't really have much space where you can inject that glow. So these ones here, that again is the reason why they use Davidson's and Toxpath, where they do a lot of rodent studies in order to get a better result than what we would then often get with formalin where retinal detachment would just be a very common problem to see. So if you ever were to do research in rodents and are concerned about evaluating well the eyes, Davidson's would then certainly be a better option to use. Uh, here is another artifact that we may see, which is this vacuolation. So we would then have to be careful. I will be talking about cataract this afternoon. And so we will have to be careful as pathologists that we don't look at this and make the diagnosis of cataract this change while it's actually just artifact. What is very good for lens evaluation is certainly the Davidson solution. And so here you can then basically see very well every individual fiber within the lens. And then also these fibers will converge in areas that, to which we refer as sutures. So again, all of these kind of different regions, if you will, within the lens are very well highlighted by Davidson's. Now, while Davidson's is good, again, you should not leave, even with Davidson's, just like Wuhan's, you should continue the process of fixation as soon as possible basically within 18 to 24 hours in order to avoid over fixation and then artifacts as we have it illustrated here.
So just like we talked about keeping it too long and formalin, that that may interfere with immunohistochemistry or PCR testing, uh, it can certainly also interfere with the quality of the sections that you can get later. So again, be conscious about what, what kind of artifacts may be potentially induced by the fixative that are being used. Uh, try to minimize these artifacts by really moving the, the processing of, your, of the globe as quickly as possible. Uh, but if, if you end up with some artifacts, just be conscious that you don't overinterpret things like this then as, as real lesions why that may all just be artifactually induced by the fixative. Now one artifact that we have seen uh, in a diagnostic setting, it's more easily ignored than in a toxpath section where uh, I have had a group of friends of mine who really had to take a lot of time in order to confirm that this was only an artifact in their toxpath studies that they were doing. Are these crystalloid aggregates here that are oxalate deposits that uh, really depend on the type of fixative that you use and at least from what we can tell also on the water quality that you use to prepare that fixative. So it, these um, crystalloid <coughs> deposits often form at the level of the tapetum, which is where we are here, because the phosphate that is present in formalin, that is present in datacins, um, that will combine either with calcium, as we are more often kind of used to seeing it, or with zinc, which is kind of like, it's also a double valent ion. And so zinc is very richly represented within the tapetum. And so again, you can see these deposits then represented just like as the other artifacts that I showed you before, just the result of fixation. So don't overinterpret this kind of change. And in the, in the Toxpath group where this was occurring, they had to do a lot of studies and finally decided to use a different fixative in order to be able to get rid of these changes uh, to show to the FDA in the United States that this was not treatment related but really kind of something, yeah, to be ignored. Um, here, I just want to use this opportunity to point out the retinal detachment that is artifactual. And so notice the photoreceptors and how you still see some bits of these attached to the retinal pigment epithelium here. So this is classic for a post-collection retinal detachment. I will be showing you this afternoon what to look for to be confident that the retinal detachment was a real in vitro, an in vivo change. So just keep this in mind here as we will be talking about retinal detachment again in the afternoon. So just be conscious, depending on the fixative that you use, if you can choose the ideal one, if you cannot, like in a diagnostic setting, formalin is often the only option, just be conscious about what to do to reduce the artifacts within the tissues. So, okay, we have the fixed specimen ready to be trimmed. And so I pointed out before that we look for the ciliary artery um, and basically inject them parallel to that because our sectioning is generally done vertically in order to get the tapetal and the non-tapetal region. There are some exceptions to that though, and there we will then depend on the ophthalmologists or the veterinarians who are sending us the cases that they will indicate. And Dicto Biltzig sometimes posts some drawings that veterinarians or that ophthalmologists may have made if they are kind of uh, particularly creative in the way of how to indicate where the lesion is located within the globe. Because if you have, for instance, a tumor or so that is away from that vertical plane of section, you would potentially miss that lesion. And it is not always obvious to us where that particular lesion is. Mainly if it is within the eye, because you would only then see that as you have made the section. 
So the veterinarian may have identified that as they did the ocular exam. So they would then have to indicate where that lesion is, either by describing it or then by putting a suture or an ink or something that would tell you where you need to make your section away from that regular plane in order to be able to get that lesion. One situation where I've seen how important that is, is in cats that have early iris melanoma, where they have multiple spots, some of which are still very shallow and superficial, and basically represent what we will discuss this afternoon as being the melanosis, kind of the hyperplasia early um, stage of the proliferation. While there may already be some that they recognize as being larger, potentially deeper, and that would raise the concern of an actual melanoma, where it's turning into an invasive cell proliferation. And so they may be particularly interested in evaluating certain spots within this iris, and they would then have to tell us how we need to orient our section in order to be able to get the most advanced lesion, because it's often not apparent to us at the time of trimming. So educating the clientele that they need to indicate the location of the lesion is very important. But again, generally, we do it in a vertical section if there is a diffuse disease process. I would like to point out here that while we often, therefore, only look at one plane of section, and we will discuss this afternoon how important it is to look at the iridocorneal angle, then superior and inferior. Um, we have in the United States, and we actually welcome any European who would be interested in joining a comparative ocular pathology society, where uh, one of our members has discussed that in addition to getting one section, he often also ends up then, whatever is left over, he gets a perpendicular section and adds that into the cassette. And that way he has a third uh, iridocorneal angle that he can look at. So if there is concern for glaucoma and he needs to decide primary versus secondary, he has one, two, three um, iridocorneal angles that he can look at in one single section. So for the sectioning, I like to use broad blades I've seen, and uh, Bill Carlton, who used to be doing ocular pathology at Purdue, where I did my residency, uh, Bill Carlton, for the pathologists in the group, may remember that his name was associated with the previous edition of the edition of Zachary. Um, at the time, it was only systemic pathology. Um, he used just a regular knife. So you can just use a regular knife. I like to use a microtone blade. The secret is in having something that is very sharp. So you need something that is very sharp, and I, the histo ladies, let me use a microtome blade that is new, and I don't use the microtome blade for more than just two eyes. That is the max that I trim with one microtome blade, because it's amazing how as you lose basically the sharpness of your instrument, what difference that makes to the quality of your section. And so again, here we have this eye, uh, where we can see a little bit of the posterior ciliary artery. And so our section will be perpendicular to that, right close to the optic nerve, so that this would then be the portion that would be put down onto the, into the cassette, so that you can then evaluate the optic disc, since that's an important region primarily for glaucoma, but also for other disease processes. So this is how we would then go about doing the trimming. Here we have a Bowen stained, uh, Bowen fixed globe. That's why it's yellowish. And so I basically start from the back because the hardest thing to cut through is the lens. And so I leave the lens for last by putting the cornea, the anterior aspect of the globe down. And so I start next to the optic nerve here that's where I put my blade. And so I keep cutting until I notice that I reach something hard, which is the lens, and then I just push down. And so if you do it that way, you should be able to get a section that looks like this. So the secret of basically you go 
slowly kind of moving the blade and then once you notice that you are at the level of the lens, you just push down. You avoid to dislodge the lens. Sometimes obviously you are dealing with a luxated lens that was already loose anyway. But if the lens is still in place, as it hopefully is during fixation as well, you will then be able to maintain it that way by avoiding that you kind of continue moving the blade uh, too much as you are making your final cut then through this region. So again, that is the ideal section then to submit for processing. Here we have a similar globe of a horse. Particularly in large animals, it's really important to get away as much tissue because it's amazing how hard the muscle gets after fixation. And the more difference you have between the hard lens, hard muscle, and the softer other tissues, the harder it gets for you then to get a nice histologic section then afterwards. And so they already have enough trouble in kind of dealing with the the density of the lens in relation to everything else um, when our histoladies, and at least in Brazil, it's an often the pathologists or the students cutting their slides. So if you were to add hard muscle in the back, then, then you can bet that you will end up with a lot of artifacts. So one more reason to just take away as much extraocular tissue in order to guarantee a better section afterwards. In some human labs, I know they even take out the lens to make their life easier when cutting. Uh, I think the lens, there may be so much going on that taking it out would really deprive us from making the best diagnosis that I like to keep it in there and unless I know I need some special stains and the lens is totally irrelevant or so, then I allow our histotechs to go and re bed the eye and take out the lens. But while I have not looked at the first section, I definitely want to see if I can keep as much of this intact as possible. Uh, at least in our lab and in many others, uh, the preference is to make a second section, like a little window. So you flip this around and then you make a second section here primarily to fit that into the cassette. There is one friend of mine in Australia who does not like to have a second window because she says that during processing if you have all the reagents going through the globe that will detach the retina and so she just makes this one section and then makes a little package. She keeps the cassette open and with string, just makes a little gift present kind of thing and puts that into the processor. So that's, that's certainly her and I guess her pistol ladies and so on don't mind that. But ours always want to have a little window which also guarantees that you get that into the cassette. And it's nice to have these what we call mega cassettes which are twice the thickness of the regular cassettes because that obviously allows you to make the second window very peripherally where you do not have to touch the lens the second time. So that way the lens nicely stays in place and you just make a little hole here that will guarantee also that you can nicely close the lid of this cassette and so you can then submit that. So this is what we use for dogs and cats and you can see there is often enough space for you to put another half moon type section then into that cassette in order to look at three filtration angles as I pointed out before. For horses, for cows and so on, we use those larger cassettes that are about twice the thickness and the length of these regular cassettes. In the United States, they are being sold as being brain cassettes because I think that's what they often are used for in human medicine. So that is certainly a nice luxury that we have. I have already offered those larger slides, those larger cassettes to Brazilian, but then they ran into the issue of not having the slides, because you need the glass slides then obviously, in order to be able to put the sections on. And so that obviously may be a limiting factor. So if you don't have the large glass slides, because you could theoretically reuse the cassettes, 
but again, that is not helpful if you don't have where to put the sections on later. Then you may have to trim down then the large globes so they fit into these regular size cassettes. So coming back to this vertical sectioning of most mammalian globes, there are some exceptions to that. And the big exception to that would be the primate globes. So that would be us then too, in the sense that we do not have tapetum the same way how we see it in most of the other animals. We do have the fovea and the macula, and so that would then be the most uh, important region to look at from, from a histologic perspective. And to get that, we would then have to make the section basically at the level of this long ciliary artery. So this is a primate globe where they made that section. So also, again, right next to the optic nerve, just parallel to the ciliary, along the posterior ciliary artery. So that we end up then with something that allows us, as they will be getting the histologic section cut down a little bit further, at the level of the optic disc. So if you get the section that allows you to get through the optic disc, you will also get a section of the macula with the fovea. And so this would be the ideal section then to look at from a primate, where you have the optic disc, and then temporal to that, you have the fovea. So remember, the fovea is the most sensitive region in the retina that we have where it's only cones that are the color recognizing uh, receptors, photoreceptors that we have. So here it's only cones that we have in this region. And we also have the highest number of ganglion cells. So if you look at this layer of ganglion cells, you will see that it is very thin here at the periphery and, it in and the number of the layers and therefore of the cells increases <coughs> as we get closer. That's because we have one cone for one ganglion cell. In the other regions, we have multiple photoreceptors that will end up converging onto a ganglion cell. Here we have one cone for one ganglion cell, and that contributes then to that very high uh, visual acuity that we end up getting here. And so mostly in the tox path world, but certainly also if you were to evaluate other primates, um, you would certainly want to know if there are any changes that are just restricted to that region. Now, what if you have rats, mice, and so on, where the globes are very small? You could theoretically make a section throughout, and so that is what they are illustrating here. Notice that they actually kind of point out here again, try to remove all the glands that you have in this region to really allow for the best fixation of the retina. Because otherwise, I showed this before, otherwise there is a very good chance that you end up with this artifactual retinal detachment. So again, you could go about trimming the uh, globe of a rat or a mouse. Um, you could also just put the whole thing into the cassette and basically ask, or at the time of getting the histosections, just trim a bit deeper into the block than usual until you see that you reach the, the lens and basically are done at the level where you would want to be. Uh, this is a globe that was fixed in Davidson's and so notice how it's completely white. So this is not from an albino animal or even if it was from an albino animal, it would not have looked completely white at the time of collection of the specimen. This is purely the result of Davidson's fixative. And so they labeled this then with ink to indicate the area that they were most interested in at the time of embedding and sectioning. So you can put just the whole globe into the cassette and submit it as such. And as I said, then have basically at the time of getting the sections taken, then just get that trimmed down to the level that you would want to. So here it's just to illustrate how the ink can be helpful in the orientation than in those globes. So here they labeled the uh, optic nerve that they had to just kind of then know at the time of orientation how that should be embedded. 
If possible, if you have enough optic nerve, uh, you may also want to remember to add a cross section of that. It generally does not take much space, so you should be able to do that into the same cassette. But it allows you to recognize localized changes as we have it in this idiopathic optic neuropathy. So that's a condition that we can see in rhesus or cinnamogus monkeys that basically represents the atrophic stage of loss of axons, of loss of ganglion cells at the level of the macula. And you would potentially miss this if your histologic section came through this way here, for instance. So by guaranteeing a transverse section, you make sure that you would potentially then identify changes that you may not always be able to get on your single section uh, that you're getting of the rest of the globe. All right, now in terms of embedding, uh, some things to keep in mind, or embedding and, and cutting, as you are kind of putting that globe down, the lens very often tilts, and so that's where that little window comes handy, because you can then, through that window, push down on the lens and make sure that it is truly nicely kind of down, embedded, horizontal with the rest of the surface, so that you end up not missing on some potential cataract exchanges just because the lens is not is, is tangential within that block. So that's something to educate. If, uh, and, and in some labs where I work, there is one dedicated histotechnician, for instance, who just takes a little bit more of time than to cut, to embed and to cut these sections. Because it's certainly different than just cutting liver, kidney, lung, and so on. In this particular globe, they ended up leaving it a little too long in the water bath. And so it ended up then, because then the tissue tends to spread, and so that's why we ended up with this very round globe. And that's certainly not the way how it looked like originally. So all little things that can certainly make a difference in terms of what your final section looks like. This section here reminds me to point out or to remind you that we have some species, some groups of animals that have bone within their sclera, birds for sure, some reptiles, the bony fish, all of those should have the globe decalcified before submitting it, for, um, before trimming it in and submitting it for histology processing. Because otherwise, if you were to, you may even be able to cut through this bone here, but you can bet that at the time of getting the histologic section, they will have real trouble and will shatter than all the tissues. So remember that um, in these pieces where you can generally already feel the bone because it's really hard. In these cases, obviously, you don't need to inject the globe because the shape is already preserved. And it, injecting it may even end up inducing some artifacts as you're trying to get through this scleral ossicle and cartilage. But um, it, it would be something that would be impairing if you don't decalcify it, which would be impairing then the sectioning at the later point. And there was a question, I think? Uh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't. <laughs>
and may even have more than one phobia. Like for instance, if you take the raptors that have to try to identify some kind of little mouse or something from very high, and so in that sense, you would actually want to see if you can do the trimming then just like you do the private animals. And then birds, if you have ever looked at the fungus or if you have ever trimmed the globe or evaluated the globe of one, you may remember that there is a pectin. So they have a vascular, they have a vascular retina in contrast to what we have in mammals, for instance. And so it is thought, I mean, it's still somewhat undetermined what the pectin is really for. But it's a very vascular rich structure, and so it is thought that it probably then provides the, the oxygen supply and so on then for the retina. That section, whether you would, that structure you would get whether you do the section vertical or horizontal, because it's right at the level of the optic disc, and so as long as you do your section at the level of the optic disc, you would get that structure in your specimen. But if you would want to get the fovea, that is something that you would really only get if you do the horizontal type of section. And dogs and cats, they have what they call an aria centralis. So if you were to do some research that would focus on that, you would certainly then also have to change your plane of section in that aspect. So some other problems that may arise at the time of uh, processing of the globe uh, are these mucocytes. We can potentially see the same problem in the gray tissue. Uh, so this is something that I've seen, some people kind of saying that relates to water quality. It can also be the result if you don't do your deparaffinization step very thoroughly. And so if some paraffin still remains, you may end up then with these kind of artifacts within the tissue. And if you don't remember, how the globe was injected, and by any chance you end up making this section at the level of the fixative injection, you may end up then with an artifact as you have it here. So here as they got the needle out of the globe, they ended up then pushing with it some of the uveal tissue. And so this can certainly then create some confusion where one may have the impression that this was a real rupture with some protrusion of tissue. So that's why it's important that you keep in mind how you would want to make your section or that you educate your clientele so that they will know how you would make your section so they try to stay away as much as they can from that area. So again, that you basically make your section this way and would then uh, keep your injection site as far away as possible, basically then at 90 degrees if, if possible. We may still see sometimes some changes that relate to injection, but that would have been to in vivo type of injection. And so if you have a case of glaucoma, where you may want to do ciliary body ablation with gentamicin injection, which basically then kills the, destroys, if you will, the ciliary body epithelium, and so would then reduce the production of the aqueous tumor that way you may end up then coming across some changes as we have it here. But this has happened in vivo with enough time for some inflammation to still arise. So that would then be the clue that this is not an artifact, that this is actually a real lesion. And so here again, um, you have a defect that looks kind of like makes you wonder is that real or not. And, but you can see that there are some inflammatory cells in that region that would help you then. And hopefully you have the history. But we have sometimes case submissions that do not have much of a history. So then evidently things like this will help you in distinguishing real from just artifact. So just be conscious that you don't overinterpret some artifactual changes. We had one case where some adipose tissue was injected into the subretinal space, and we were a little stumped by that initially too. I mean, we obviously don't expect any adipose tissue within the globe, and that really looked like a little kind of aggregate of adipocytes that was not causing any problem whatsoever. Uh, we then found out that they had tried to inject that globe it was a bird eye, it was an ostrich eye, 
And at the time of trimming, we saw that there was this little white spot that we thought, oh, this looks like a real lesion. And they later on then told us, no, this globe actually had been injected at the time of necropsy. And so we then disregarded that change. Freezing. I've seen some people doing that because they thought, oh, then the globe is nice and hard, and I can really easily trim the globe. And another situation where we see that more often is that as they are submitting the globe during a hard winter time, and if that is then, oh, it's a specimen that is being shipped and may then stay on the truck or wherever for a while, that that may end up then reaching or getting below the freezing point and you end up then with a specimen that looks like this. So if you are in an area where it may get really cold in the winter time, it would be good to educate the clientele to add some alcohol to the fixative. So about 10% of alcohol to the fixative will lower generally the freezing point enough to allow this um, basically prevent this from happening. So because otherwise you end up with these kind of artifacts. So yes, it makes it for an easier trimming, but it makes it for a lot harder histologic evaluation of these tissues. Intraocular prosthesis. So there's sometimes clients that do not like dog owners, cat owners or so, that do not like the idea of having just a closed eyelid then in the place of a diseased globe, and that may ask for an intraocular prosthesis so that it looks more natural then. Uh, this is something that would be really difficult to cut. So while it would, in theory, make for a very nice section, if we were able to keep the prosthesis, it's impossible to cut by just regular processing. And so you would have to take the prosthesis out in order to be able to get the regular section. <coughs> Eviscerated intraocular contents is what we would then generally receive before we may potentially end up receiving the whole eye with the prosthesis. Because obviously here they kept the sclera and really only emptied that globe from the internal content. They may still want to know, often the question is, do we have a tumor? Uh, and so they basically will then be submitting this whole thing then for a pathologist to evaluate. And um, so this is what it will then often look like. And so um, again, neoplasia is often the big question, but ideally you can try to go beyond that and see if you can find indication of uveitis, cataract, uh, even a retinal detachment. Sometimes amazing how much you can do. It's like putting a puzzle together because you have these bits and pieces. And so you have to, in your mind, kind of see, okay, where do I have portion of the, of the iridocorneal angle? Where is then the choroid with the retina that is often detached and so on? And see if you can identify any lesion. As you have eviscerations, and again, I understand it's generally not in our hands, but in the veterinarian's hands, where we will then have those samples collected and submitted. Uh, it's always good to make sure that we have the lens, kind of put everything into formal, and if the samples are too small, put them into cassettes and submit them into cassettes. And then one thing that one should really refrain as much as possible is not to put them onto a paper or wood where it gets stuck, and then you cannot really get it off without tearing it apart even further. So just put it all together into formalin. Generally, it's kind of like just keep it as a piece like this, and then it doesn't really matter how you trim it. I often try to keep it as intact as possible or just try to section through the middle of this and then submit everything. Ideally, you submit everything so that you will make sure that you're not missing anything. Lastly, conjunctiva and cornea. So these are very small, thin specimens. And so they're again trying to fix them in a way that one will know how to trim them and evaluate surface and so on is really important. And so the suture wrapper foil, uh, plastic as they have used here, or even cucumber that you make a slice of cucumber and basically then put that on there. I've seen this also being used for endoscopic biopsies where again, orientation, making sure that you keep the specimen as flat as possible 
ends up being important. With cucumber, you can certainly then trim the entire cucumber then together with your specimen. With the other ones, uh, you would then kind of gently get them off and then trim them in to where you will then hopefully be able to get the surface to look at. In this particular case here, it was a candidiasis case. Um, so denuded epithelium of the cornea with PES positive yeasts proliferating in this area. And then the deeper stroma here. Because they would certainly want to know if they got margins on whatever lesion. And so that's why orientation is important in maintaining that. So hopefully, kind of, as you keep in mind all these different steps from the time of sample collection, again, removing tissues and so on, up to what fixative to use, how to go about fixation, how about going cutting, trimming, processing, and so on, you will end up then with a section that looks pretty much near to perfect. Uh, as I said, it's a tissue that is very prone to artifacts. They may make sometimes beautiful type of pictures, but it certainly ends up being a lot tougher than for you to be able to interpret a section that looks like this. And so uh, that's where one has to try to have everyone come together, whether it is the collecting person, a student on the necropsy floor, a veterinarian in the clinic, up to who is trimming the specimen. Those that get into our lab, generally they call me because I also like to take gross pictures. Uh, up to having dedicated histotechnicians or dedicated students or whoever would be doing the sectioning. Um, so that, again, you end up with a specimen that looks like this. And hopefully only get this for jokes rather than for real diagnostic evaluation. So that is the end of this presentation. Is there any question? Yes. For the tissue processing protocol, you know, once you put it in the machine, do you use the same protocols you use for other tissues or you, you use different protocol for ocular or actually eye globes? So the question was about the processing protocol, if you will, if that differed between ocular specimens and others. And maybe if you had a caseload that would justify doing it separately, but uh, we just end up putting it into together with with the regular, with the other tissues. Yes? Do you need an uh, injection technique for very small lines, like chinchillas, ferrets, something like that, informally? So, uh, rodents for sure, uh, I, where the lens is disproportionately large in relation to the rest of the globe, we generally don't, um, don't fix them or, uh, by injection. We generally then just put them into formalin kind of and immerse it their way. But kind of knowing that we may end up then having some artifacts that may arise from there. And that's why uh, at least I was part of a study in a diagnostic setting and then definitely also Toxpath where they wanted to have the ideal section and that's where they then got Davidson's. So if you know that you really want to get the best specimens for research or for evaluation of treatment effect or something, then you may want to get the Davidson's because that fixes a lot quicker and therefore then reduces the artifacts. You just need to remember to get it out of Davidson's then basically within 24 hours and continue processing because otherwise you end up inducing artifacts the same way. So you have to kind of then just see if I were to inject or something, would I potentially induce more damage than doing good or so on. And so um, it's, you have to work on all of these things then on a case-by-case -case basis and just see what would seem to be best. And potentially be conscious about some things that may need to be ignored then down the road in your sections because they would be artifacts that were created during the process.
then keep it uncomfortable before you would then. Then you can put it back into the form of it, like all the other tissues at the time of processing. But for maintenance, you would you would keep those specimens then. Uh, so the order is uh, different than alcohol and then formalin and then And then, yeah, so formalin and then you basically do the right. Formalin at the time of regular. So that should have preserved then everything the way how it was at the time of 
And when you get uh, an eye open your plagia and the uh, doctor doesn't mention that this is and you do the vertical section, after that you do another public section on, the, on one of the halves. Yeah, so I, I certainly look at what I have done within the eye. And we have had cases where it was just like dog, and like you had a little or something, and you didn't have a clue what was going on in that case. And then you section it and like, oh wow, I had not imagine that everything was this was going on. Um, then you would have to change your planes of section and that may end up then being less than ideal because <coughs> things may start falling apart.